Welcome to our first virtual bushwalking field trip. Um, because we can't venture out as a group, we're going to give a bit of a virtual bushwalk a go. And I'm going to take you through exactly what I would have taken you through if we're out on the trip together. So that you'll get the information about what you need to take, how you need to prepare, and what you're looking to do with your participants when you're out on a bushwalk. So let's start with preparation. Um, come inside and I'll show you what I've done in prep for the bushwalk this afternoon. Right, so as you know, this unit's about you learning to lead others in the outdoors. Whether that's for recreation, whether that's for training for fitness, or whether that's to be a future outdoor leader taking remote trips or even just gentle rural trips for your participants in whatever capacity you end up working. And as a leader, you have to look at the trips a little bit differently. You've got to be prepared, you've got to have a different set of gear. So we're looking at this through the eyes of a potential leader, not as a participant. So what's the first thing that you need to have done? You need to have done the research on where you're going and why you've chosen that area and what's appropriate. Now you've already done that because you've submitted your assessments on your project that you're organising. And for the group that are taking the bushwalk, they looked at a range of areas and chose one that had requirements such as within an hour and a half of Melbourne, had some interesting features, had a suitable length and suitable terrain for the clients that were going on it. In this case, it was us. In the end, the groups chose either Warrandyte or Werribee Gorge, but unfortunately, in the climate we're in today, we can't do those. So I've chosen a coastal walk, which is within the area of about one kilometres to two kilometres from my home, so that I'm not um, against any of the recommendations at the moment on the advice for COVID-19. So in doing the preparation for that, I got online and had a look at the options. So I got a map. In this case, it's just a PDF map of all the features along this coastal walk. Normally you would carry a topographical map, which gives you all the topographical features and a lot more information. Um, and we'll be going through maps in more detail if you, under, if you undertake 116 in the next semester. Also, I've downloaded information from a coastal walks brochure about the sites that I'll be showing you today and the highlights of that walk. Along with um, information about the walk, in these particular walks we also have the advantage that they have an app where you can um, listen to dialogue and more description about the walk if you wanted to. So in fact you could actually share this before the walk if you were a leader so that the students were really in tune with what they're going to be seeing on the walk. Other things that you have to do if you're leading a trip and which you will have done as part of your outdoor programming project is look at collecting information about your participants. So you make sure you've got your medical and indemnity forms and that you've looked at them and seen if there's any relevant medical, pre-existing medical conditions that you need to know about and you need to carry this with you. You will have filled out your other critical incident forms and you will have completed a risk management form. And in that risk management form you will have all your emergency contacts, who your on-call person is and all the hazards that you've identified and addressed in this document. And that you've also done as part of your outdoor programming project. Also you need to consider the weather. And in preparation for any field trip it's fairly obvious that you have a good understanding of what weather is being predicted for your walk or your paddle or your cycle or your camp and you need to make flexible arrangements in case that weather prohibits you from undertaking the field trip. Your best points of weather um, sources is the BOM app and then METI and I've talked to you about that in class and we'll be revisiting that again before the end of semester. But if you look at BOM, Bureau of Meteorology, go to Victoria go to METI down the bottom of your screen, click on that, you can get three hourly updates on everything, wind, temperature, rain, every aspect of the weather that you need to consider. So that's a very important thing. For today's bushwalk, we've got light winds, sunshine, and the biggest risk we'll have in terms of weather is protecting ourselves from the sun. So it'll be a good day. 
So I suggest this paperwork that you're carrying as a leader needs to go in something. And map cases, you obviously always carry your map in your map case, but tuck in behind the map your paperwork, your risk management documents, and your medical forms, and carry that somewhere where it's easily reached, either on the outside, of, attached to the outside of your pack, or just in the top pocket of your pack. So a map case will keep it dry and give you easy access both to your map and the other emergency information if you need it. So let's have a look at the equipment. Let's start with your pack. Any simple day pack for an easy walk like we're doing today is fine. But two things that are pretty essential is that you have a hip belt and a chest strap. That takes the weight off the shoulders and shares it evenly between your hips and your shoulders. And I'll show you that later on, just before we start hiking, when I have the pack packed. If you've got rainy weather, you should probably um, have either a cover for your backpack, or this is a waterproof cover that goes over your backpack, or if you don't have something like that, pack your gear in either some simple dry bags, or in plastic bags if you've still got some of those circulating around and you can reuse them. That just keeps your gear dry if it's predicted to be very wet because obviously you can still hike in the rain. The only considerations you need for weather is severe weather and high winds if you're in a treaty area. Otherwise your trips can go ahead as long as your groups are prepared. So that's the basics, essentials, backpack, dry bags or a cover to keep your gear dry. And then you need other additional gear as a leader. And your participants will need proportions of the same sort of gear. So if you work through the gear for your clothing, the first thing that you need is a rain jacket. Just a good rain jacket that goes down over your bottom is fine. And you don't have to have anything super fancy at the start of your career or on your participants don't either. Just something to keep the weather off. If you're predicted to have heavy rain, I highly recommend that you also have overpants um, to keep you completely dry. Then again, according to the weather, you need layering with your clothing. And we go into depth with this if you decide to do the unit um, next semester. But just keep in mind you need a warm top and you put that under your waterproof layer and you can take it off as you go. And you need headwear according to the weather. So if it's cold, you need a warm hat, pop in some little gloves. And if it's hot like today, you need some sort of sun protection. A full brimmed hat is the best, or a peaked hat at the minimum. But as a leader, you need to set an example, and you need to be showing that your son's smart. An option also is to have gaiters when you're bushwalking. It's normally for where you're going into prickly areas where there's a risk of snakes or leeches. Gaiters are a simple, um, protective measure that goes over your boots and around your ankle um, and it fits snugly over and gives you a protective layer. I'll show you that later when I put on my boots. Speaking of boots, on a day like today and where we're going you wouldn't need proper hiking boots but if you get into rougher, rockier, muddier terrain a good set of hiking boots are essential and again you'll cover all this equipment in more detail in another unit but you just need a general understanding for the uh, field trips that you'll be leading in this trip in this unit and with good footwear you need some sort of socks that you know are not going to rub and cause blisters there used to be the old adage of um, two pairs of socks but um, there's other ways of preventing blisters by wearing good socks without having to go to two pairs so make sure that you choose socks that you know are not going to aggravate or rub on your um, feet and also that possibly they wick the sweat away. So these are a wool um, sock and so if my feet get sweaty um, it wicks the water away from the skin and it's one of the main causes. Friction and dampness are the main causes for blisters. So just have a think about that when you're preparing yourself as a leader and also what you're recommending to your participants. So in terms of clothing the only other thing that you probably need to think about is making sure you have some sort of eye protection to, for sun and also for dust and wind and twigs and sticks and all sorts of things. So eye protection is really important. And while we're talking about protection, sun protection. You all know about sun protection. You've been brought up in a generation that knows how much damage and how 
much damage you can get from the sun on your skin. So make it sure that you always, no matter summer, winter, dull, windy, whatever, you wear some sort of sunscreen, possibly some sort of lip protection. And remember, there's no such thing as windburn. And if you don't know about what that is, you can ask me in class next week. Okay, you also need, obviously, if your walk's more than a couple of hours, some sort of uh, nutrition, some snacks. Um, you don't need to get fancy, and simply some nuts and an apple would suffice. Anything that, you know, that suits you. If you have heaps and heaps of lollies, you'll find you get very thirsty, so beware of that. And water, at least enough water for the duration of the trip that you're doing. So make sure that you've got that covered. A camel pack is a really good way to hydrate yourself. Um, they're the plastic things with a tube that goes over your shoulder and you just sip it all the time. It's a great way of hydrating. Um, but for a short day walk like we're doing, you probably don't need to go to that level of equipment. Other things that you need to consider, particularly as a leader, is first aid gear and equipment. You should always carry your own personal first aid kit, but as a, that's what your participants should carry. But as a leader, you need to carry something which has got a lot more in it. And this is a this is a group first aid kit. This is supplied by the university to all the leaders who lead trips, and it has um, epipens in it. It has masks for um, resuscitation and quite a lot of additional first aid equipment. And that's a group first aid kit. When you're a group leader, you need to carry a first aid kit that will adequately um, equip you to deal with a fairly significant first aid issue. So as a leader, you're carrying a different level of equipment for first aid. The other thing you need to carry as a leader, obviously, is a compass and you need to have some sort of understanding of navigation unless it is a very, very, very simple walk along the coast like we're doing today, actually. But a compass is always handy. And then a couple other extra bits of equipment. A mat of some sort. This mat can, it is silver on the inside and it will be able to help protect a participant if they had hypothermia and get them off the ground. You can help use it to keep them warm and you can use it to help make an emergency stretcher if you need to. Also, some sort of closed cell foam mat that will help insulate somebody off the ground and also for you to sit on while you have lunch or do an activity. Easy, chop up one, they're only about four bucks, chop them up, make it into a smaller thing or take the whole big mat, mat if you like. Um, they're fairly important. Some additional things, these are essential, a trowel, in case you need to go to the uh, bathroom while you're out in the bush. Toilet paper, a very rare thing at the moment. And hand sanitizer, also a very rare thing at the moment. So you can't have mine. Uh, along with that, I always carry a little bag and it has a whole lot of other things that are useful in case of emergencies. So I have spare lace, if somebody gets a broken boot lace, or if we need to make a stretcher. I have a lighter in case we get stuck and we need to make a fire. I have two different types of pocket knives. This is a basic pocket knife and this one has um, pliers and a little saw and all sorts of things. That's in case you need to fix something on a backpack or if you're out in a canoe or a kayak, you could use that for some of the gear. I carry salt in case of leeches and a head torch in case we get stuck out there longer than possible. Sounds like overkill, doesn't it? But if you just throw them in, they're always in your gear and you just throw them in, you never know when you're going to be able to use them. So um, I suppose the whole point behind all this is that you need to be prepared at a higher level when you start to lead people. And this basic gear will see you through almost anything. So without further ado, let's head on out.
you are aware, choosing the location of your field trip, whether it's a bushwalk or a paddle or a cycle or a dive, is probably the most important decision you make. What are the outcomes you're trying to achieve by doing this field trip? And then what area would enable you to meet those um, outcomes? So for today, because we couldn't travel very far, I've chosen the coastal walk that is um, very close to my home, but also I know this area well. So there's features that I can share with you as participants, even if it's only virtual, um, that are highlights of the area. And when you're choosing a walk in particular for today, you need to make sure that you're choosing a hike that's within the capabilities of your participants, that's interesting and has some high points. And also if you want to put some other learning activities like talking about sense of place which I'll be doing with you today and perhaps a little bit of solo time which I'll also be doing with you today then you need to choose an appropriate place. So consider that when you're working with your projects to make sure that you're meeting the outcomes that you want to achieve with your participants. So this walk today is along the coast. It's a probably a three or four hour walk and we're going to head um, north towards the city. But before we head off I was doing some reading and it talked about some fossils that are in some cliffs that are just the other way. So for the start of the walk we're going to go and have a look at those. Before we do that I just want to talk to you a little bit about how you do a trip briefing. Because before you start a briefing has to be done with your participants. What do you cover in a briefing? You cover things like a welcome and an acknowledgement to country. So let's start with an acknowledgement of country here. So today I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the country of the Boorong people and acknowledge their elders past and present. The other thing that you need to do in a briefing is to make sure that your students or your participants feel comfortable, that they have all the correct gear and that you're up to date with their medical information. So you just need to ask them to come and speak to you privately if anything's changed from what they had on their medical form. You need to check their contents of their packs to make sure that they have water, waterproof clothing, sunscreen and the obvious other items that I talked about previously. You then need to talk a little bit about the area, do your acknowledgement of country and explain to them how the group might work. You need to designate somebody who leads the group and who knows where they're going, perhaps carries the map. Who's going to be at the end of the group? Is that you or another staff person or another student? And who's carrying the first aid and emergency gear and communications? In this case, we've only got a mobile phone, but if you're going more remote, you would need to have a satellite phone as well or some other form of communication. What else do you need to cover in the briefing? On your LEO site, I have some examples of different types of briefings which you can access to have a look at them. But generally, you just need to talk about how long the first section is, when you might be stopping for breaks, what you might be planning to see along the way, and ask if there's any questions. You will also do a bit debrief, which I'll talk to you about later on in this trip. Okay, so let's get going and see if we can find some of these fossils that I've read about. The notes say that the fossils are in some cliffs just down here, so we're going to start by going down there and see if we can find them. Interestingly, I've been looking to see if I can find the fossils in the cliffs around here, but there's a lot of native vegetation and a lot of this vegetation was used by the indigenous people um, for herbs and spices and for nutrients. And um, there's massive lessons in the type of, of plants they used for spices and for nutrition. But this area is also abundant for all sorts of other things. And one of the things, um, that I just noticed here is a 
urchin shell and they used to also use these and um, hopefully on this walk I'll find some middens and show you some remnants of where they used to sit and eat all this seafood. In the meantime I think we sort of better keep looking for those fossils. Well, I brought you down here on the start of the trip because um, I was promised when I read the brochures that there would be dolphin and other marine creatures fossilised in the cliffs here. This is perhaps a fossil. This is perhaps a fossil. That's perhaps a fossil, but I certainly can't see anything that looks like a, an intriguing dolphin snout or something like that. So there's a bit of a teaching point there for you guys in terms of leadership. Um, you really do need to know your area quite well and I didn't know if I could find these fossils or not. So is it worth the extra 20 minutes to bring the students down here to um, all the participants down this way to see it? That's up to you to judge when you're looking at the area that you're in. There is a lot of other learning to take place and if I look at my feet, I can see a whole range of um, rocky platform invertebrates and different marine creatures that are existing on this rocky platform. The tide's coming in and with that we'll get a change in their, where they are and what they're feeding on. Um, that's really information for another unit. Um, come and do the marine unit if you want to learn more about that. But just remember when you're leading groups that it's important that you build the skills over time so that you really know the areas quite well that you're taking your participants into because then you can teach them all about it, the indigenous plants, the, the animals that live on these rocky tidal platforms and possibly if you've found them, some fossils. We haven't had any luck in finding fossils here today so we're going to head north and pick out the best features of this walk for this afternoon. Oh, and one more thing. When you're planning trips, it doesn't matter what sort of trips it is, you've got to think about your timing. So normally there's a little bit of a rough rule of thumb that after the first 10 or 15 minutes, and it depends on the activity, you need to do a bit of a gear check. So if people are walking and they have packs on and they have all their clothing, perhaps it's been well, windy and cold or wet, they'll start to heat up and they need to stop to be able to take a few layers off, have a sip of water, and to feel comfortable, adjust their packs, their hip belt, the chest strap and get themselves comfortable. It applies to all your different activities as well, but particularly for walking. So we've been walking for about 10 minutes. So at this point, if you were with me, I would ask you to have a check. Are you comfortable? Do you want to take any clothes off? Do you want to put anything on? Have you got any questions? And then you would stop according to what the interests are along your walk. If you're doing a multi-day walk, of course, you can't be stopping every 20 minutes to hunt for fossils but you normally have to give participants at least 10 minutes break every hour. So try and remember that. Okay, let's go. Okay, so we've now entered the Ricketts Point Marine Sanctuary, which is, takes up a chunk of this walk. It's three kilometers long, and it basically goes from where I'm standing here up the coast for three, just over three kilometres, or um, its area is actually 115 hectares. So it's three kilometres along the coast and it goes out for 500 metres. You can actually see some of the markers out here. Um, there's a green marker, there's also the yellow boating markers, but the green marker is the outside area. And it's a sanctuary, and since it's become a sanctuary, the marine life has. Um, become a lot more healthy in the last 20 years since it's been a sanctuary. There's a huge amount of marine life, there is lots of important ecosystems and an abundance of not just the smaller marine creatures but some of the bigger marine creatures as well. There is um, smooth rays, big smooth rays, eagle rays, we get dolphins in here, we also get some sharks and we get a range of other 
sponges, nudie branches and a multitude of fishes. So it's a beautiful area and it's well preserved now. But it goes for the next three kilometres on this walk and if you're taking a group of students into an area like this that you know well, you could spend some time explaining some of the different um, options of places that they can visit on this walk, particularly if they don't have an opportunity to do, say, a marine unit. So let's go and have a look at the Ricketts Marine Sanctuary. Hey, no messing with the jellies. As a leader you should also be aware of the different environments that you're moving through and what the changes that are occurring in those environments are and so you can then highlight them to your participants. If you decide you're going to go into teaching, the uh, year 11 and year 12 study designs talk a lot about changes to the environment and you can highlight these when you're on your trips. For example here we have a um, water course and if you follow the water course you'll see that it um, is coming from a drain. It'll be a drain that's um, draining the roads from extra flow of water. Although we haven't had any rain here for a couple of days or actually even longer so I'm not quite sure where that water source is coming from but the drain is emptying down into these rocky platforms and then down and out into the reef. The water looks clear, but it will affect the ecosystem in some way. One of the things that you're going to have the opportunity to do is to take people into natural places. As I've spoken to you about before, natural places are a place that can give people a feeling of well-being, of peace and of rejuvenation. So a place like this, it's great to see that people are getting some joy out of just literally walking in the shallows and other people are getting joy out of walking along the beach or walking their dog and you have a multitude of opportunities if you decide to go into this area of sharing the natural world with your future participants your future clients and it's great to be able to show them that you can enjoy the natural world and also feel safe and comfortable I know that um. I have mentioned to you a couple of times how important it is to know your area. But you can also know an area and use it for a number of different activities. Particularly if, say, you're working with groups that um, can't travel very far or you're focusing on reducing your carbon footprint, which hopefully we all are doing. So I use this area as well for the marine unit, as I've mentioned. And it takes a little bit of research to understand what opportunities are here. So for example, there is a marker out here on the rocks and then there's another marker, a green marker further out to sea. And about 50 metres off that green marker, there's a trench, a deeper trench, and you get a lot of fish species and a lot of bigger marine mammals coming in through that trench. So it's important that you are able to understand what opportunities each place has. You can also use these sorts of places for sort of more environmental interpretation. For example, you can see the pelicans and the black swans. And the black swans are vital for the ecosystems of all the bays, Ramsar sites, and in fact, all marine ecosystems because they are the only animal that can digest the seagrass. And they digest the seagrass and then they have their droppings and then the smaller microorganisms eat those droppings and then they get eaten and so forth up the food chain. So these black swans out here are crucial to our ecosystem. And having a bit of an understanding of where things fit it, to share with your participants is particularly important. One of the most important things you need to cover before the trip or at the pre-trip briefing is about minimum impact practices or they can be called leave no trace practices. The most important thing, the fundamental principle behind it is that you enter a natural area or a semi-natural area and you leave it in as good as condition or hopefully even in a better condition than when you entered it. So for today we're not going to go into all the details of all the different aspects except that we need to understand that our participants may be anxious about where they're going to go to the toilet. If you're on a remote 
walk, you need to teach them how to toilet correctly in the bush and you should be carrying these fundamentals, toilet paper, a trowel and some sort of hand sanitation. However, in a walk like we're doing today, where it is natural places but in a very rural setting or urban setting, you need to have done some homework to make sure that you've got some amenities somewhere not too far off that your participants can access because they will be wondering about where they're going to be able to go, so to speak. So here we have a couple of toilet blocks along the way. So before we get going, I think I'll use the amenities. So what we have here is a midden. It's not that easy to see, but if you look closely, you'll see there's bits of empty shellfish shells, um, and there's a range of other different types of shells going all the way back into the bush. And this was an area where the indigenous people used to come with their gathered shellfish and food, and they would sit there and eat it. And they tended to come to the same spot every time and over the years these shells built up and up and up and many of the places along the coast have these middens. They're often missed by other people but if you look closely they're all the way down at all the different levels throughout the sand and there's some ranging all the way back into the bush in this area. So it's a pretty special spot and there's lots of different types of shellfish that they used to eat and different um, invertebrates that they used to collect. Unfortunately when we came, well not when we came, but when the British arrived and settled Australia, the Aboriginal people as I'm sure you're aware um, were pushed out of these areas. There was a lot of wetlands, they all dried up because people were putting um, more earth in there to build houses and they were eventually pushed off this land. But this is evidence that they existed here for thousands of years. As you can see, we're not very far from the city. So these sorts of field trips, which are in natural spaces and places, but they're not far from um, urban environments, which allow people to catch public transport or ride or walk or carpool, um, enable us to have less of a carbon footprint when we're offering our programs out in natural settings. So consider that when you're doing your planning. So wherever you can, try and plan for activities that enable people to come into natural environments but that don't cause damage to the environment by creating more carbon. It's funny because when I came here to show you the view of the city I noticed that down here we have another midden. So they're scattered all the way around here and it's been a long time since these places have been used for eating places but they still exist. Have a look. You need to give your participants a break. This looks like a pretty stunning spot to me. You need to make sure everybody has a drink, somebody has, an, has some food. People have different levels of energy, different metabolisms, you know all that. Just make sure that you give them enough stops that they're not feeling a little bit sugar or water depleted. And try and choose a nice spot, somewhere like this, where the outlook's gorgeous. As I said before, try not to encourage participants to have too many lollies. You want a nut? Thanks. Make sure they drink from an ACU bottle and replenish their sunscreen. That way 
they feel like they've got energy, they're hydrated, they're not getting burnt, and they can enjoy this amazing city. Don't stay there for an hour though if you've got a timeline, 20 minutes, and then move again. Stay longer if it's for lunch. Let's go. So this is an interesting part of the walk. It's a series of wells that were dug or chipped out of the rock really by the indigenous people to collect fresh water. So the water ran down or runs down this embankment and it pulls into these little water wells and they could collect their fresh water in here. At the moment, sadly, they're full of beer bottle caps. But if you taste the water, it's fresh. You need to plan some time for some quietness and perhaps some reflection. So choose a nice spot by a river on top of a mountain where you can give your students, your participants, an opportunity to just sit quietly, listen and reflect. you might need to consider is that your participants might find this hard. So think of, think of some activities you can ask them to think about while they're sitting quietly. To listen, to see how many sounds they can hear, to try not to speak at all, to ask them to concentrate on what is drawing their attention. There's a range of different things that you can get them to focus on to enable them to have time to just be still and be in the place that you share, you're sharing with them. get closer to the end of your trip you need to be thinking about or have already planned what you're going to do for your debrief to, to bring the experience to an end and to enable your students to sort of reflect or your participants on what they've experienced for the day. One of the ways to get them into the mind space of what they might contribute or what they might think about what they've just been through is to give them some solo walking time. And that entails just asking them to spread out, not be able to see the person in front of them, behind them, and they should just walk on their own for 20 minutes, an hour, 10 minutes, whatever they're comfortable for. Put some safety measures in so they don't wander off in the wrong direction or fall off a cliff or whatever. Um, and they can be things like, we're all gonna meet at the track junction. You're gonna walk with a five minute break in between you whatever suits the environment that you're in. And then ask them to think about some particular questions about sorts of things like what they enjoyed most for the day or what they can hear or how they felt even just being on their own for that amount of time walking in the bush or on the coast or wherever you are. So set a framework up so that when you come to drawing the activity, the field day to a close, you have enable them to get into that space of thinking about what they've experienced. So yeah, a little bit of solo walking is a good thing.
day's walk. And there's just some final things that you need to consider as a leader. How do you finish the day? Can you highlight what the participants got out of it? What things really worked? What things didn't work? What's your perception and what's their perception of what happened? So running a little sort of closure or debrief session is really helpful. So find a place that's nice, that's comfortable. Maybe with a view, maybe not. Maybe just a patch of grass. And go through a couple of little activities that will open up the space and place that they feel safe and that they can talk about their experiences today and reflect on what they did and what they perhaps enjoyed, perhaps what they learnt. There's quite a lot of debriefing activities that you can do. There's the stick, rock and leaf activity, but I'm not going to um, go into that today because you'll probably use it for your facilitation activity. There's a range of different ones, some of them we've already used. But you need to think of something that's a bit fun, very easy, doesn't take any equipment, that encourages people to express what they're thinking. Um, and I'll leave that up to you because that's part of your uh, next assessment. But draw it to a close and then just go through the final closure in terms of safety, returning any gear, and then the most concerning and probably the thing they need to think about the most is safe driving home if they're driving from the trip. Thank them for coming and explain perhaps what's to look forward to next time. And thank you for joining me today virtually. I'm really, really sad that we're not doing it together, but we probably will have a chance at the end of semester, which will be fantastic. So, thanks. <laughs>